Uh, hello there. Hello, Bruce. How you doing? Great. Pretty good. All right. Just the two of us, I guess. It's almost time. Hey, Faye. Hey. How you doing, Faye? Doing great. Good. So what's it been exciting? Did you guys go to church today? No, oh, we, uh, we're we still a little leery because Yvette's had a hip operation. Uh -huh. and, uh, and my back's a mess, so we didn't want to get any any, any chance of getting anything else. Uh, he he was in rough, rough shape like, yesterday. Yeah, I barely move. Oh, gracious. Yeah. There's well, Steve and there's Adele and Randy. And he's <laughs> I can't see him. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Now we can't, can't see, see it now. Y'all need to just like sit closer. You only get one. <laughs> hey, Steve. <sighs> Adele, did you guys go to church this morning? We did. Did you? Yes. We watched it online. It was good. It was good. Yeah. We bought his tapes last year, and I thought, oh, that would be good. We'll listen to him in the car. Uh-uh, he's not that kind of a preacher. <laughs> you have to sit there with your Bible open and, you know, your pen and paper and all that. Yeah. Hi, Pat. Hey, how you doing? Are you doing okay? I'm improving. I'm improving, but now Frank's down, so uh -oh. it's a toss-up. One of us is going to have the most attention, you know? Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. just jealous, right, Frank? <laughs> I hurt my back so she'd feel sorry for me. Oh. <laughs> I could do that. <laughs> I was saying. Yeah, it's uh, a recurrent thing. I've got a bulging disc. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. I'm just so thankful that this didn't happen yeah. right after my sister left because I could do nothing. He could do nothing. And we just, I don't know, we probably would have vanished. <laughs> <laughs> Lost a lot of weight anyway, yeah. who knows? <laughs> well, that's not a good thing to do. Let's see if I can do this. See. It's old ages for the birds. Yep. You got that right. It's yep. not one thing, it's 10. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Bob's not doing too good. His sciatic is bothering him. That well, that's what good. happened to him the that's last a, time. That's exactly what I've got. It's a, a disc in the low spine that's pressing yeah. on that sciatic nerve. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Does it go all the way down your leg? Yeah. yeah. Miserable. Yeah. It's awful. It was in his foot the other day. So it's kind of odd. But. Oh, there's yeah. Hi, Jeff. You better be quiet now. <laughs> I know. We have to behave. The prop is here. Hi, Susan. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I miss you in choir. I miss choir and I miss you. Oh, I miss you too. We were we went to the eleven o'clock service today, and I don't think we'll make that mistake again because we could. We're just now getting here. Uh, oh. That makes it hard. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess we all have a Sunday school on revival day, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was. We went to the eleven o'clock, and we barely. As we got out of church, it said 18 minutes to one. Oh, and I thought, oh my goodness, we're not going to make it. Well, I was driving back from North Carolina and pulled in, and here comes Amy pulling in behind me. And I was like, what is going on? I know. <laughs> Long winded preacher. There must have been something. something well, extra. I can't say <laughs> anything. <laughs> Start, I'm right? sure I've been called bad and worse. <laughs> not bad. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Somebody probably thinks I preached too long. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> Jeff, have they said anything He's about it? <laughs> What's that, Yvette? Have they said anything at your church about going to Sunday nights? No, we haven't mentioned it right now. We we did hear a report from uh, one of the ladies in the church that's a nurse. She said that uh, the cases in Henderson County were, were still rather high. They had, uh, at her hospital, they had set aside a, a particular uh, wing, I guess, for the
COVID patients and it is now full, which is the first time in any of this that it's been full. So oh. she was just <laughs> warning everyone, uh, be especially careful because, you know, it, the virus is still uh, still there and many people are contracting it. So uh, I think we're going to wait a little bit longer and see what uh, what's going on with that. I'd hate to to get us back on Sunday night and, and that be a contributing factor to a uh, outbreak at the church, you know. I had one more question. Um, I sure. noticed when we got the information on the Sunday school classes in the email that nothing was mentioned about your class. So that was only for classes that were going to be held at 10 o'clock. So yeah. was there an answer to that situation or? As far as for me right now, I, I, when I talked with Mark before my understanding of the situation changed slightly, I told Mark that I was going to keep going uh, until I started Sunday, Sunday night services back. Okay. Uh, at the very least, I was going to keep going until I finished the book of Ruth uh, because I didn't want to um, cut off the end of the study. That, that just seemed to be sort That's of the sad way for it to conclude, right? Yeah. So I, I, I'm a little up in the air on that right now, but we're going to meet for as ho however much longer it takes to finish Ruth at least. And then uh, and see what we want to do at that point. You know, uh, I know that Mark is willing to take the class. Uh, I just need to, to talk with him more specifically about it. Since the last time we talked, I had a slightly different idea that uh, had been shared with me. So, but right now, for the, I would say for you know a couple of two maybe three weeks, I think we still need some time to finish up Ruth. So, for now, we're just going to stay with that, and then we'll we'll reassess at that point. Okay. I mean, if that's okay with everyone still. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll just keep keep going with what we had planned to do from the, uh, the, the, the time we talked about a couple of Sundays ago. All right, well, let's uh, go ahead and get started with prayer. Uh, let me share a couple of items quickly. Still hearing good reports at North Greenville. Uh, our Friday report, uh, we have 34 students that have had the virus at this point. Uh, which is up 10 from the previous week, but still um, still a pretty low number. N no faculty, no staff have been diagnosed. So praising the Lord for that. Uh, I did have another student in one of my classes that has uh, contracted the virus. So I want to pray. Won't give his name just for privacy issues, but I uh, want to pray for one of my freshmen that uh, let me know this week, about midweek, that he was going to be in isolation. Uh, and, and so continue to pray for him. Uh, we also had an unexpected situation develop with one of our professors. Uh, he has been diagnosed with some health issues, and he is going to resign at the end of the uh, of this semester. So that's that's always uh, an unexpected resignation. Puts some pressure on, you know, particularly those in his college to fill the classes that they need to to offer for for student numbers. So uh, let's pray for that situation as well and uh, ask for the Lord to be gracious. Uh, other concerns that you would share with us today? Uh, my brother, his wife's name is Janice and she's been having a lot of trouble out of her back and her side mm -hmm. nerves hurting her. And she's been to the doctor several times and they were going to do something, give her some kind of shot, but they couldn't because her blood pressure was too high. So now they're trying to get that under control. So her name's Janice. All right. Is that with a T, Janet, or Janice? Janice. Okay, Janice. Uh, let's remember Randy's brother's wife, Janice, as she's uh, struggling with severe back pain and now uh, unable to give her the shot they were going to do because of blood pressure issues. So uh, let's pray they can figure out the right uh, combination of treatments so that they can get her blood pressure under control and also give her the remedy she needs for the back pain she's experiencing. Someone else? We can add Frank to that very same thing. His back is kicking up again. So we're hoping oh, to hear from the doctor tomorrow. I'll tell you, if you, if you uh, have that lumbar shot, really does the job, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it can be temporary or permanent, but it didn't, didn't work yeah. well. And, and Bob yeah. also, Bob's got it I've too. I've got the same thing, so <laughs> I, 
Do you? Well, maybe okay. if you could be a twofer and, you know, we'd save some money. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's pray for Frank again. Uh, his back's giving him a little trouble. We were, we were certainly hopeful that the shot would last longer. Uh, and maybe it will, but let's just pray for him. And then for Bob, who I was not aware is struggling with a similar issue there. Um, so pray for God's hand of healing on, on all three of these dealing with back issues. Someone else? We have a praise. Uh, Yvette's about ready to start running laps. Her hip is doing so well. Awesome. No walker, no cane. Right. I mean, I'm grooving. I'm yeah. just, woo. <laughs> so Yvette is recovering extremely well from her uh, hip replacement, and she's doing great. Just in time for him to take the other side, see? So we kind of switch it off. <laughs> Trading back and forth. Right. Peggy, God. did you have something there? Linda Carroll called me, and she's also down with her back, and she's waiting for a doctor to call. They probably will do surgery. Okay, okay. wow. Well, that's number four. So let's remember uh, Linda Carroll. She's waiting for some answers on her back situation. Uh, we Peggy, you're going to have to help me remember this. We had prayed for her grandson, I think, uh, he with some heart issues, maybe. Is that right? Do you have an update on that? Yeah, he has a tumor on the stem of his brain. Yeah. Oh, the tumor. Okay. He is, uh, they were able to get the uh, test. Um, what do you call it? Um, MRI? No. It's the, they've got him on a plan. I don't know what you call it. Anyhow, they were able to move it from California to New York. <laughs> And he gets to go like Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and they treat him on this whatever it is they're doing right now. And uh, so hopefully we can just pray that this works. Okay. Let's continue to remember Linda Carroll's grandson with the uh, cancer treatments and uh, what they're trying to do there. I'm also uh, remembering that uh, Gary and Janie were traveling, and I'm assuming they're not here today because they're still out uh, visiting there. Tomorrow. Susan, can you give us any update on that? They'll be home tomorrow. Um, I also wanted to say, since I'm talking, we Gary and I talked to John Clary today at church as we left, and um, Gail is going to have to have, his wife is going to have to have hip replacement surgery uh, coming up next month and uh john is gonna have to have so shoulder surgery uh coming up he didn't say exactly when he his was um i'd also like to ask prayer for uh my mine and gary holman's um dad his his younger brother had a heart attack uh thursday he was he had gone to go golfing and he uh, got out of the vehicle went around to get his golf clubs and they found him with the hatch up and he was on the ground and uh, they they got him to the hospital they worked on him but they never got him back and his funeral is tomorrow and Gary had called me and he said because uh, Dad has one sister left that's alive. That's that she uh, lives in Kentucky, and we were trying to figure out how to get her up to New York. They live in Riverhead, outside New York City, to the funeral. But then Gary called and he said we can't go anyway. The state of uh, New York put out a thing on Tuesday saying that there's 30 states they won't allow people come in to the state unless they quarantine for two weeks first. Well, we can't yeah. get up there and quarantine for two weeks in the, when the funeral is Monday. Um, right. mm -hmm. So just keep uh, his wife, Joan Coleman is the last name. And they've got a son, Robert, and uh, his wife and child, the only one family that's up there. So none of the rest of us can go. And, uh, okay. and also, I'd like you to remember our uh, son-in-law, Tony Patrick. Uh, he's been working a uh, contract for the state of South Carolina. Uh, the ones that get the guys that don't 
pay their child support. That's the only way I know how to describe. He does computer stuff. But uh, his contract's up the end of the month and as of yet doesn't have another job. So um, we're just praying that God brings the job for him that he wants. Okay. Well, several needs here. Uh, John and Gail Clary. Uh, Yvette's got a, a partner in hip replacement now, it looks like, with uh, Gail. And, uh, we <laughs> and we know that John had been having some shoulder problems, so uh, he's now going to have to have surgery on that. And then let's remember the Holman family uh, in the loss of this uncle, uh, also for his wife, Joan, and for his uh, children. And just the whole situation, uh, I know that New York was having a surge in cases again. I'm assuming that's why they have uh, enacted the quarantine it, again. Is that what it is? Yeah. Gary just said there was 30 states that they put on Tuesday. They put a New York state mm -hmm. put out and said, if you're from these 30 states in South Carolina and Kentucky, we're on yeah. that list. And my aunt lives in Kentucky and we live in South Carolina. So. Yeah, well, that's disappointing for sure. So let's uh, let's just pray about that. And then, uh, of course, um, uh, Gary and Susan's son-in-law that needs this uh, job opportunity to open up. We'll pray for God to open that up. All right, anything else? Does New York have a checkpoint at the borders? Does anybody know? I don't, I, I don't know whether it's strictly a volunteer thing, but the way yeah. Gary said it to me, he said, donate, he says, we're not going to consider anything like this. And he is my little brother, but he does hold <laughs> yeah. a of opinion. It's, it's Como being Como. That's right. Is it Como being yeah. Como. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I have to agree with you that uh, it does seem very unlikely that there's any way they could really manage that. Uh, no. That but, ban. You know, the Bible teaches us to obey, you know, the laws of the land. And sure. we're supposed to wear seat belts. When we get in a car, we're supposed to stay <laughs> under the speed limit. And if we don't, we pay the price sometimes. You know. Yeah. Oh, I'm in total agreement with you, Susan. That's why I wear a mask every time I go up to my church in North Carolina because the governor there, you know, made that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, executive order, whether I like it or agree with it, I think Christians need to be law-abiding citizens. Yeah. And uh, as long as it's not something that violates our conscience or our uh, or our, the requirements of faith, then we, we need to uh, recognize that God has put uh, leaders in positions of authority uh, for our good. That's what Paul says in Romans 13. So, uh, But it is disappointing for sure in this situation. Also remember, All right. Bryce, Bryce anything? Bryce starts chiropractic school tomorrow oh, yeah. and so it is going forward then it is he will know tomorrow he still doesn't know any schedule or anything he just knows he has to be there tomorrow and then after that right. he doesn't know it's that's a frustrating thing for him because he's a planner by nature he doesn't like things not to be <laughs> <laughs> Well, I understand that, too. <laughs> he has to be uh, nice I, to me. Today's our 51st <laughs> wedding anniversary, so he oh, has come to on. be nice. Yeah, she's been, she been blessed twice. She's been, I'm <laughs> worried about me. <laughs> well, that sounds, like, uh, that sounds like something we can praise the Lord for, 61 years. Wow, that's, that's exciting. No, 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 no. no. Thank you. Yeah. If you want. <laughs> I figured y'all got married when you were just early teens. That's it, right there. I mean, you know Kentucky, right? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. You know what? It is so good to have friends like you all that we can visit with and talk with and joke with and laugh with. Amen. Thank you. Amen. This has oh, yeah. been such a blessing, mm -hmm. you know, just seeing yeah. you Praise the Lord. week and, and thank you. Happy to well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. We Absolutely. Lost you. We lost you, Jeff. Yeah.
It looks like I've, I've uh, had a little trouble here, but it looks like it's trying to reconnect. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Okay. Well, it's got the little circle saying connecting, so maybe I'll, I'll – Amy's coming over to see if she can figure something out. We see your phone emblem now. Okay. Now I see you. <laughs> but it'll probably well. come on. Come on. I don't know quite why it's doing that. It's all lit up. Did you pay Maybe he could go out and come back in. I don't know. Maybe. As we've lost, we've lost the internet connection to the Wi-Fi router, but the Wi-Fi router is listed. It's not listed on the laptop. Uh, and that's an old well, one. Here, yeah, that's the most important thing, even though yeah, you are. Yeah, we can hear. Yeah, we can hear. Yeah, you. as long as you, as long as you can hear me, I guess we can go ahead with everything. We can hear and, you. And uh, I don't guess you have to look at me to be able to follow the lesson, huh? Yeah, we do. Know what you look like? <laughs> I, I do look the same. So. Well, Amy's going to going to work on that, but let's go ahead and uh, have prayer so that we can get into the study, and hopefully we'll get uh, connections reestablished. Uh, but let's go ahead and pray. Father, we give you thanks for this day, Lord. We ask you to bless us now as we come together via the the technology of uh, this platform. Uh, God, we pray you'd help us to work through these technical difficulties that they not become a distraction to us in our lesson today, but we'll be able to focus in on. Uh, your word, and God, be able to take from it those things, God, that will help us better understand who we are, who you are, and Lord, how we can relate to you. Uh, God, we do pray and lift up the concerns that have been shared today. In each case, we pray your presence be felt and your will be done. Uh, Lord, we want to pray for Janice as she's dealing with this back issue, and Lord, with the, the blood pressure uh, issue that's not allowing her to receive the treatment she needs, we pray, God, you put your hand of healing on her. Uh, God, we pray for Frank as he's again experiencing some some uh, trouble with his back, Lord, and just pray that uh, they'd be able to to find the, the right uh, lasting solution to uh, his trouble. Uh, Lord, we, we pray as well and lift up Bob, who is also struggling with a back issue. Uh, pray for your hand of healing on him. For Linda Carroll, uh, who is also dealing with back pain, uh, just pray and ask for your grace to them. Lord, we pray as well, and thank you that Yvette is doing so well in recovery from her hip replacement, and just continue to pray that you'll give her strength. Uh, Lord, we do continue to think of Linda Carroll's grandson who's dealing with cancer uh, as they begin uh, working towards the, the treatments that he needs. We pray, Lord, that, that we'd be effective in helping him. Uh, God, we do pray and lift up John and Gail Clary. Uh, realizing that both of them are dealing with issues that require surgery. Pray for Gail as she gets ready for a hip replacement, and John for so, a shoulder surgery, Lord. I ask God that you'll be able to, uh, to work through the hands of these doctors to bring healing and restoration to them. And God, we do pray for uh, Gary and Susan's uh, family in the loss of their uncle, uh, especially in this COVID situation, Lord, where uh, they're not able to travel to be a part of the funeral, Lord. It's, I know, very disappointing for them. Uh, God, just pray that you'll bring comfort and peace to them in this time. Uh, Lord, as well, we pray for uh, Joan and for uh, the, the children, God, as they're grieving. We thank you that your word tells us you're the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our time of need, Lord, uh, in the ways that only you can. And so we pray that they would feel your presence uh, and your spirit with them. Uh, Lord, we do pray as well for Gary and Susan's son-in-law who is in need of a job. Pray that you'll open up that opportunity, Lord, that he needs. Uh, God, we pray and uh, just celebrate 51 years of marriage and ask that you will bless uh, Gary and Susan going forward, Lord, as they continue to be faithful to you. And Lord, God, to be a witness to the world of your design for the marriage relationship, Lord. And God, that, that companionship, that uh, covenant, Lord, that is lifelong and that allows uh, for the strong foundation for family, Lord. And we thank you for the Holman family and the ways that we have seen uh, that family make an impact in our church as well as in 
the larger world, God. And so we just continue to pray that you'll bless them and help them. Yes. Lord, we do lift up other needs. Pray for the revival at uh, Clearview, that everything will go well. We pray for North Greenville. Thank you that, uh, again, so few cases. Uh, continue to pray, Lord, and ask that you'll uh, protect our students, faculty, and staff, Lord, from a major outbreak. Pray for those students that are recovering. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, Bryce as well as he gets ready, uh, hopefully, to get on schedule with his chiropractic school tomorrow. Uh, even though it's a little uncertain right now, we just uh, pray that you give him patience and, uh, Lord, help him uh, to be able to find the, the right balance in his desire for uh, be, being able to have a, a schedule that's clear. Uh, Lord, now we ask that you'll help us as we move into the study of Ruth and that, uh, God, you'll meet all of our needs in ways that only you can, God. We, we thank you and praise you and ask you to bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Did everybody hear that Tom's tumor wasn't um, present when they did the MRI? Yes. I did, I did not hear that. Yes, it was not there when they did the MRI this last one. He goes back in December or November, something like that, and have another one. And if he if it's still not there, then then it's going to be like six months or something to just to keep up with whether it's not. But they're the doctor's very pleased, and of course Tom and Diane are uh, very relieved. Well, uh, that's wonderful news. Praise the Lord for that. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm still having trouble getting the video up, but everyone's still got audio, I guess. We can yes. see you now. Yeah, we, see you. Okay. we see you. But the emblem for your Oh, you phone see me now? Yeah. <laughs> the emblem for your phone is still up with it. So. Okay. Well, I guess we have restored it. Yep. Um, we're just going to leave it the way it is right now. I don't want to mess with anything and try to change anything, so. Uh, let's go ahead and turn to Ruth chapter 4. And we'll return to the scene at the gate in Bethlehem. Are y'all still hearing me? Yes. yes. Okay. I usually hear a little a little ambient sound in the back. I just want to make sure because this my screen's flashing on and off a little bit for some reason. Okay, uh, so we're at the gate scene. Boaz is interceding uh, with the elders and negotiating with the Goel or, or the the kinsman redeemer, the closest of kin. And uh, we will be bringing in what we looked at last time in Deuteronomy chapter twenty five. You remember we went and finally looked at the legislation for the Leverett marriage, and we saw a very unusual uh, tradition there where the woman, the widow, actually goes to the gate herself, and if the man refuses to do his duty or take on his responsibility, uh, she actually uh, removes his sandal and spits in his face, which is uh, obviously a public shame issue. Uh, we're going to connect with that in a minute. Remember that Boaz has volunteered to take care of this situation for Ruth. And so he's actually gone to the gate himself. Uh, and of course, his status in the community recommends that things are going to work out well. So reviewing chapter four, uh, when he gets to the gate, he sits down and waits for uh, the Goel or the closest of kin to arrive. Uh, remember the, the, the kind of funny sounding term that's used in the Hebrew text there, uh, Poloni Almoni, uh, or Mr. So-and-so. And so uh, he sees him coming through the gate. He says to him, sit over there. He gathers 10 of the elders, and he says, sit down here. And then he begins uh, presenting the case. And he presents it in a very unusual way. We ended last time where he's kind of set up a little bit uh, the situation in his favor, which seems to indicate that he does, in fact, want uh, to, to fulfill this role uh, for Ruth himself, although he realizes that the closest of kin uh, legally uh, has this responsibility and must be given the opportunity to accept or reject his responsibility. Uh, and so what he's done then is he says, uh, here's our situation. Naomi, who came back from Moab, has a piece of land, and it needs to be redeemed. And so uh, I thought to, and actually I didn't mention this last time, it's kind of a funny idiom or expression in the Hebrew, 
uh, where it says here in verse 4, the New American Standard translates, so I thought to inform you, uh, saying by it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. Uh, in the Hebrew, it literally says, uh, uh, I have uncovered your ear. Uh, and kind of a strange way of, of indicating uh, that he's told him that. So I, I, I uncovered your ear so that you would be able to hear this or know about it. Uh, and so now he uh, challenges, in a sense, the uh, kinsman redeemer. Uh, if you will redeem it, then you go ahead and do it. Uh, if not, tell me that I may know, for there's no one but you to redeem, and I am after you. So in other words, if you're not, give me your intentions. If you're not going to do it, let me know, uh, because I'm next in line, basically. Uh, and remember, we ended here with the Goel saying, I will redeem it. And in fact, again, I didn't mention this, but in the Hebrew, it's emphatic. Uh, where he actually says, and I, I will redeem it, or I myself will redeem it. He, he's absolutely almost enthusiastic or presented as enthusiastic here about redeeming the land. And of course, we mentioned here, uh, there may be a good reason for that, because as he redeems the land, uh, as he purchases it, purchases it, he actually gets use of the land and would, able, uh, would be able to, to farm the land and perhaps get some own uh, some benefit to himself, as well as uh, providing some money to care for this uh, destitute relative. Uh, I think, however, that Boaz has kind of put him in this position <clears throat> because what he hasn't done, and really this is interesting, remember uh, Boaz's whole point for going up to the gate is to make sure that Ruth's request is fulfilled. She's actually requested that Boaz marry her and provide an heir to carry on the family name, uh, so in this case, it's interesting, Boaz hasn't mentioned anything about that yet. He's just set up uh, the, the situation so that this Redeemer uh, has an opportunity to, to function as one who would provide for uh, relatives who have gotten into a, a financial situation uh, with a piece of property. I think he's done that on purpose, though, because it allows him now, after this man has agreed to buy the land, uh, he's going to now add the next level uh, of his responsibility into the mix. So let's pick up reading there in verse 5 of chapter 4. Uh, then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabites, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. Uh, Boaz now discloses the full matter. He says, look, there's a field that needs to be purchased or redeemed. Will you redeem the field? Uh, Poloni Almoni says, yes, I will redeem the field. He says, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, if you buy the field, you're also going to have to take Ruth the Moabites and have a son with her to carry on the name of your deceased relative. Uh, notice his quick change of tune in verse 6. The Goel, or the closest relative, said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption, for I cannot redeem it. Now, I'm thinking that Boaz had this in mind all along. Think so too. Uh, that he present this in two stages, uh, that it might, in fact, work in his favor, because it's clear that he's already told Ruth, I I'll be very happy. Your, your kindness to me, uh, the second kindness is greater than the first, by not going after the younger men, uh, uh, giving me the honor of uh, redeeming uh, this family line and marrying you and providing a male heir. So it's clear that Boaz desires to do this, uh, but in this case, he wants to make sure everything is done according uh, to uh, the legalities of the law. And so in this case, now, I think he's kind of set this up. And uh, when, the, when the Goel hears that he's going to have to also marry Ruth and provide a male heir, uh, he has a little bit of a change of tune. Can anybody kind of think with me, uh, in light of verse 6, what is it now that the Goel is not willing to do? Take on Ruth. Okay, what, what he realizes is, if I take this piece of land and Ruth goes along with it, 
then I'm actually buying a piece of land that will eventually be passed on to someone else. Yeah. Uh, remember in the Leverett marriage, when uh, this man would take Ruth and they would have a son, that son would be considered uh, legally to be the son of the deceased, of her husband, and of Ruth. And so this property then that he has invested in by acquiring would actually go uh, to this son. He, in a sense, would lose his investment in the property, and it would jeopardize his own inheritance uh, because he wouldn't be able to uh, gain back the money that he had spent in helping the family. Now, in some ways, uh, this is, uh, I might say, a shameful thing to do. Uh, whose interest does he have clearly first in his own mind? His own. Yeah. <laughs> his own interest. He, he's, he's more concerned with how this is going to affect him uh, than he is with providing for this brother-in-law that's died or for this, uh, this family member that's died and actually continuing his name. Uh, here we have a little bit of a contrast. Uh, what we see here is the picture of Boaz, who is willing to go above and beyond what's necessary to take care of these two widows, Naomi and Ruth. Uh, he has already, uh, in some ways, taken a personal loss. Can we kind of think back on that? What are some things that Boaz did back in chapter 2 that, that actually cost him something in providing for Ruth and Naomi? Allow them to glean. And All right, the way, he, the, he, the way he allowed Ruth to glean among the sheaves, and he even told his servants to drop extra so that she could pick up more. Uh, so essentially, he was losing grain that uh, rightfully belonged to him. What else? Barley he sent home with uh, Ruth. Yeah, remember this whole idea of the, the theme of uh, Naomi saying, I went out full, but the Lord brought me back empty. And so he sent this huge amount of grain with her in chapter 2. Uh, and then, of course, after their encounter at the threshing floor, he says, hold out your garment, and he pours more grain into her garment to take back because he says, I don't want you to go back empty-handed. Uh, you know, it, it's very clear that Boaz has already been making personal sacrifice in order to meet the needs of these two. And now this uh, closest of kin basically says, I'm not willing to sacrifice anything. If I can't get something out of the deal, I'm not interested. Now this is where Deuteronomy 25 comes back into play because in the legislation there, the widow is the one who goes to the gate and seeks out this closest of kin and gives him the opportunity to fulfill his obligation to the family. Remember, this isn't just a, a choice he had. This is an, a responsibility by law that he has to do this. And, of course, uh, in that case, verse 7 back in Deuteronomy 25, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. Uh, if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He is not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. The elders of the city will summon him, speak to him, and if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders, pull his sandal off his foot, and spit in his face, and declare, thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. Uh, in Israel, his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. Uh, in this case, because Boaz is representing Ruth, we don't see this part of the legislation fulfilled. We see a slightly different version of it. So uh, it's clear now that the kinsman redeemer, or at least the closest of kin, is unwilling to take this responsibility. He realizes it's going to cost him something. Uh, and in some ways, this is a shameful thing to do. He basically acknowledges, I'm only concerned about myself. Uh, notice what happens next, beginning in verse 7. Of chapter 4. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, and he removed his sandal. Uh, then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, all that belong to Kilion and Machlon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabites, the widow of Machlon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers 
or from the court of his birthplace, you are witnesses today. Uh, notice there's something different here. Verse 7 says that there was a tradition uh, whenever a piece of land changed hands, that they actually symbolized that by the removing of the sandal. Uh, th there's been some dispute among scholars how to take this. Some scholars who don't believe in the inspiration of the Old Testament will argue uh, that here we have a, a story that was actually uh, either one, not historical, that was written at a much later time, uh, or two, was written at least at a late enough time where they no longer knew about the law in Deuteronomy 25, and so therefore they, they're not aware of the custom of the widow. Uh, I'm going to argue differently in this case uh, based on two things. We don't have time to do this, but if we actually went back to Genesis chapter 13, when Abraham and Lot, at that point, uh, Abram, Abraham is called Abram still, uh, when they split up and take territory, God tells Abram uh, to walk throughout the land uh, to see its boundaries, essentially to claim it. And so in the ancient world, when you were claiming a piece of territory for your own, uh, it is often the case that you would walk the boundaries of that land to claim it. Uh, this re actually reflects on the story of Jericho in the first city that's conquered in the Promised Land. Y you might remember the unusual way that uh, Israel conquered Jericho. What, what did they do when they came to Jericho and God told them instructions on how they were going to conquer it? Marched around, marched around. You remember how they marched around it one time each day for six days, and then on the seventh day they marched around it seven times. They blew trumpets and the walls fell down. Uh, many, many scholars see in that the walking around the city was actually a formal way of claiming the city for God uh, by walking around its walls. In, in very similar way, Abram walked the boundaries. Uh, so here's the thing. In chapter 4 of Ruth, verse 7 indicates that there seems to be a second tradition, uh, that by removing the sandal, someone acknowledges, in this case, the, the sale of land, uh, or the passing of land from one to another. Uh, in other words, because it's the sandal that uh, would be on the foot of the one who is walking around and claiming the land by taking that sandal off and giving it to uh, the one who's purchasing the land, he is essentially relinquishing his claim to the piece of property. Uh, scholars have tried to make that into an issue that uh, maybe this is a problem. They didn't really know the Deuteronomy legislation. I'm going to argue the reason they don't do what's in Deuteronomy is because Ruth is not at the gate. Remember, this is a unique situation. Boaz has volunteered to go to the gate and take care of this legal matter. Anybody remember, why do we suggest that Boaz maybe decided it would be better for him to go to the gate? What, what's Ruth's problem that she may have in this case? She's a more yeah, she's a foreigner, so she has no status in the gate. So remember, Boaz is willing to go and negotiate for her. I'm going to argue uh, the, the reason this doesn't go as uh, we might see it go in Deuteronomy 25 is because since Boaz is going, uh, in a sense, uh, in proxy for Ruth, uh, the widow is not there to actually go through this event of shaming the man. Uh, but I do think shame is still involved because First of all, remember, this man has not been named. He's just been called Mr. So-and-so, and we indicate that maybe because of the shameful fact that he refuses to take his responsibility, it may also be a way of de-emphasizing him because he doesn't follow through. So let me just say this, and I want to be clear on this. Is this man still, in a sense, uh, does he still have some shame attached to him for his refusal to, to follow through with what's required of him? Yes. Yeah, I would say he's definitely still got some shame attached to him. Because Ruth's not there, she doesn't actually take his sandal and spit in his face. Uh, and maybe there's a reason for that. And maybe this helps us understand Boaz's strategy. Uh, let's just assume he had let Ruth go up to the gate. The man had refused, and Ruth had gone through this. Uh, that would actually be some strong pressure on the man to possibly change his mind uh, in, in light of this. Uh, he knows what's coming, in other words. Uh, the spitting in the face, the removing of the sandal, and, and the giving of this name, uh, the one whose sandal is removed. I, I wonder if Boaz was thinking, uh, if Ruth's not there to go through with this, if I go in her place, then I might have a better chance of, of coming out with being the one to marry Ruth. What do you think? Could be. Possibly, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. I, I think he strategized the whole way through this. Uh, by not having Ruth come, he's able to actually avoid this element that might uh, encourage the man to change his mind and, and actually take Ruth as his wife, whether he wanted to or not. Uh, we did see that back in Genesis, you remember, uh, with Judah's situation and his sons, the second brother uh, took Tamar. He didn't want to, which becomes clear later when he refuses to go through uh, with having a son. Uh, and so maybe here Boaz is sparing Ruth even more uh, by actually getting the man to, to state his motives up front in a place where he won't have the threat of this widow spitting in his face and, and him being uh, shamed publicly by having his name called the man whose sandal is, review, uh, is removed. Uh, again, there's a little bit of, of question here and how that works out. But my understanding is that in this case, I think Boaz has used this to his advantage. And so in uh, light of the fact that they make this exchange, uh, what in verse 8 the Goel is doing is he's actually giving up his legal right to be the, the leveret or uh, the brother-in-law who will redeem the marriage. And now notice what Boaz does in verses 9 and 10. It, this is actually legal language that he enters into here. Uh, he says to the elders and the people at the gate. In, in other words, this is almost like an attorney uh, in a case making uh, his public statement to the court uh, of the resolution of this case. He says, first of all, you are witnesses today. We talked about the fact that at the gate, uh, the elders would often serve as witnesses. Anybody remember what they would also do sometimes as witnesses uh, to try to ensure that the, the vows that were taken before them uh, were actually kept? Anybody remember what witnesses would do in that in that time? Is it putting the hand under the thigh or something like that? That, that is one way to symbolize it. Right. But often what the witnesses would do is they would evoke the name of the gods as actually divine witnesses to uh, what happens here. And that's what's interesting. Uh, when God tells Abraham not to make a covenant with the people of the land, it may very well be because in going to the gate of the city and making the covenant, uh, that would be the statement of the witnesses who witnessed the covenant. They would call upon the names of their gods, which in some way would acknowledge that perhaps those gods were, in fact, uh, true gods. And so in this case, uh, we, we don't see uh, that stated, but when he says you are witnesses, it, it's very clear these are formal witnesses, and it may well be that they even would have evoked the name of the Lord here, uh, much like the Ten Commandments, uh, it cautions us, don't take the name of the Lord in vain, don't lift up his name to falsehood or to vanity. Uh, in other words, don't attest to an oath with the name of the Lord unless that oath is going to be kept. And, and so we, we're entering into this legal kind of uh, setting where the elders now are serving as witnesses, uh, the people are serving as witnesses that this transaction has been taken care of legally. And notice uh, now Boaz says, I'm buying the land. Uh, I'm buying all that belong to Elimelech, all that belong to his sons. I'm standing in now as the kinsman redeemer. And then he goes one step further. I have also, or moreover, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabites, the widow, widow of Machlon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance, so the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. And so he states the clarity uh, of this decision. I'm not only taking the land, I'm taking Ruth, and I have intention of following through uh, on raising up a son to carry on the name of this family that has been in jeopardy as a result of the tragic deaths of Elimelech and his sons. And now notice the response of the people, verse 11. All the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses. So this is uh, essentially a formalization uh, of the decision. Boaz has offered to the closer of kin the opportunity he has refused. They have formalized that by the removing of the sandal and the transfer of the land to Boaz. He has now stated that he has received that land, but he's also taking Ruth to raise up the name of the deceased uh, so that his name is not going to be uh, lost in the court of his uh, birthplace. 
And now the people formally say, we are witnesses. In other words, we accept the responsibility of witnessing. Now, again, it's not said here, but more than likely, what they did was draw up a written document uh, where the 10 elders that uh, Boaz had brought to the gate would actually sign the document. We've actually found, again, some evidence of these types of documents in the Hittite culture, which was contemporaneous uh, with the time. Uh, of Abraham. And so that tradition, although we're past Abraham's time, very well may have com continued even into this time. But either way, uh, whatever they did, it's a formal agreement. It's been witnessed. Uh, it's been signed, so to speak. But notice what the people go on to do here in verse 11 after they agree to be witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephratah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So not only do they agree to be witnesses, but, and again, very much in the theme of the book of Ruth, they pronounce a blessing on Ruth. Uh, notice uh, some key names here. Who were Rachel and Leah? Jacob's son. All right. Remember Jacob, who had deceived his brother Esau, fled back to the family home in Haran, met his cousin Rachel at the well, agreed with her father Laban, uh, his uncle, to work for seven years for her. Unfortunately, Laban deceived him and gave him Leah in her place and then said after the fact, I I'm sorry I didn't mention this, but uh, the older sister has to marry first in, in our culture here. And so if you want Rachel, you've got to work seven more years. And so uh, Jacob, who was a deceiver and deceived his own brother, sort of gets poetic justice here in being deceived by uh, Laban. And he works for 14 years for both of these sisters. And remember how, unfortunately, he didn't love Leah, but she began by the, the Lord's grace to provide sons for him. She actually gave him four sons in a row. Uh, then, uh, of course, Rachel steps in and says, well, I'm barren, but hey, uh, why don't you take my servant girl and have sons with her for me? And so then Jacob has a couple of sons with Rachel's servant girl, and then Leah goes through a period where she can't become pregnant. So she says, uh, Jacob, why don't you take my servant girl and have sons with her for me? And so Jacob does, and then Leah has a couple more sons, and then finally Rachel has the favorite sons named uh, who? Joseph and Benjamin. Yeah. Joseph and Benjamin. Uh, that's where the 12 tribes came from, a pretty dysfunctional family. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, they actually take us back in history, and they pronounce a blessing on Ruth. Uh, may she be like Rachel and Leah. In other words, what are they asking God to do for Boaz and Ruth here? To be fruitful. Yeah, bless yeah, give them what? Children. Children. Many children. Yeah. Not not just this one that will carry on the name of the family, but even to go beyond that to bless their marriage so that they have many children. Uh, what a great blessing. But this is the one I wanted to get to today, and this is where we're going to end. But remember when we went back to Genesis and read the story there of Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar and how eventually she dresses up like a prostitute for justice to be done because he's been withholding his third son uh, in light of the fact that two sons have died that were married to her. And, and remember, he comes into her. He doesn't realize who she is. He thinks she's a prostitute. Eventually, uh, she reveals her true identity to him, and he declares, you're more righteous than I was. Uh, and she actually bears twin sons. And so here's uh, a reference to one of those twin sons, uh, to Perez, and, uh, of course, this is the building up of Judah through Tamar uh, carrying on. And so uh, just an interesting tie-in back to that story that we looked at as sort of a model for the Leverett marriage. Uh, now the, the, the city, the elders, the, the, the people gathered in the court pronounce a blessing in the name of Rachel and Leah and in the name of Tamar. Why is that quite interesting? Does anybody remember from the story of Tamar? What was her background ethnically? She was actually a Canaanite woman. Mm -hmm. yep. So Judah had married into the, the peoples of the land there. This seems to be an appropriate blessing, doesn't it? Because although Jacob married into the family by taking Rachel and Leah, 
Judah, his son, married a Canaanite woman. Uh, in this case, Boaz is taking a Moabite wife. And so uh, it seems like they're, they're very much aware uh, of the situation that Ruth and Boaz are entering into, and they give an appropriate blessing here, uh, which I think is important. And maybe at this point, I'll just bring in something. Do the people at the city uh, gate appear to be aware of the stories of the earlier parts of the Old Testament? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they absolutely do. And this seems to me to remind us, although some scholars have tried to suggest that these stories never really happened historically, uh, this gives a strong testimony to the historical nature of the events of the Pentateuch and of the remembrance of the people of those events uh, and their ability uh, not only to remember them, but to understand them in a way that connects with their own contemporary situation. So uh, again, I think I would say it this way, when we read the Bible, we realize we're not reading it in our own situation. Uh, we're reading what happened to someone else, but can it apply to our situation? Okay. Well, of course it can. Here's a great example. In a little bit later time in the days of Ruth and Boaz, uh, the stories of the beginnings of Israel, the beginning of that family, they're able to understand and apply to their own context in a way that allows them to bless uh, Ruth and Boaz as they come together. So maybe we'll end with this thought today. Would you say that the people in the gate approve of what's happening in this marriage? Very much so. It absolutely seems that they do, uh, which is quite unusual. What can we attribute that to? I think what we can attribute it to is what Boaz says in chapter 3. What did he say, say everybody in the gate knew about Ruth? She was a her character. Yeah. She was a woman of character. Uh, I think this is a major theme, and we're going to trace it out a little bit more as we come back next time. We've still got a couple of, of lessons, I think, to go. Uh, but the character of Ruth has made it possible for Boaz to take uh, a Moabite wife and to have the blessing uh, of the elders and of the people of the city uh, in the city of Bethlehem and Judah. Uh, that is, in some ways, astounding, but it shows us what kind of Ruth, a woman Ruth was for her to elicit the blessing uh, of Bethlehem over this marriage. And uh, I think it's going to move us forward as well in understanding the resolution. So uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll be dismissed today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at this text, even with a little technical difficulty today. I pray that we were able to, to stay focused. And God, again, what we see, Lord, are the men and women of character in your word, men like Boaz who were willing to go above and beyond the call of duty to provide for the needs of those who are in uh, a very difficult situation like Naomi and Ruth. And, and to see a woman like Ruth, who even though uh, is an outsider, God, who has been recognized as a woman of excellence and character and now elicits the praise and approval uh, of the, the, the court, uh, the city gate in the blessing of this marriage. Lord, help us to be people who live our lives in such a way that others see uh, our character and that they give you praise and Lord, as a result of that, we are able to do your will and to minister in your name. Uh, God, we pray you'll help us to look for opportunities to do that kind of ministry this week as we go out from class. And we pray that you'll bring us back safely uh, as we return. Lord, help us in our church as we continue with the revival this week and also as we begin to move back to normal patterns of Sunday school, Lord. Uh, we just thank you for all that you've done for us, and we continue to see your hand at work, and we give you praise. We ask all these things now in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We'll, Thank you we'll see you at one next week, and uh, we've got at least a couple more lessons to go. So I'll talk with Mark between now and then and, and see what uh, what needs to happen as far as returning to the regular classroom. Uh, and we'll, t we'll talk about it a little bit at the beginning next time. Okay. okay. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Thank you. Bye. See, you might see you at the revival. Okay. There he is. He's on there now. He's probably under the camera. I'm not quite sure. Still on.